All right. Good stuff. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Children ages 3 years through 5th grade that wish to go to the Gospel Project time, you're dismissed at this time. As always, we welcome children to stay in the service. Matthew chapter 7. Give a brief introduction, then I'll read the Scripture, and then we'll pray. We are in week 4 of a series called Ignite the Fire. In this series, I'm seeking to share some of the most impactful sermons of my life. Sermons that I believe go into what it means to have a passionate, loving, vibrant, fruitful relationship with God. Today's message is about the balanced Christian life or the stable Christian life. And as I share, I have found this house diagram that I'm going to share with you in this message to be extremely helpful to me personally. And I have seen it be greatly used of God in the lives of others. So let's stand together in honor of God's Word as I read Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. God, would you now use your word and your spirit to make us the house that is like this house on the rock. I pray that you would save the lost, heal the sick, deliver the demonized, equip your church to be all that you would have us be here and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Jesus in this story describes two homes. They are two lives. The first is the house that's built on the rock. And the winds come and they beat against it, but because it's built on a solid foundation, it does not fall. The next house is the house that's built on the sand. This could be a person who doesn't believe in God, so they have no foundation. This could be a person who believes in the false god, various gods throughout the world. And therefore, it's a life built on sand. Or it could even possibly be kind of a possible born-again Christian, but their understanding of God and His Word is so minor or skewed or or out of whack that, that when the difficulties come, they get kind of thrown off. The reason this is so important is because Jesus makes it very clear that the winds and the waves will come against the believer will come against us. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. Be of good courage. I have overcome the world. James 1 says when you encounter various trials, not if, be of good cheer or rejoice because it's trials and difficulties that build your character. Paul told Timothy in, in the book of Timothy that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Over and over in God's Word we are told that difficulties will come. And so today we're going to see a picture of a stable life, of a balanced life, of a life that is the way God intends it to be. This truth today, this house diagram that will now be on the screen, and I encourage you to to jot this down, just jot it down in your notes so it's in there and you can refer to it, has had a huge difference, made a huge difference in my life. I have seen it help many people, and I believe if you will live what this diagram represents, and we're going to go through it piece by piece, you will see your life greatly impacted for the positive. The tragedy is that many people today, and we'll, get to, we'll see this over and over if you didn't get it all, what happens with many people is they turn their house upside down. And they make the foundation what they do. Consequently, they live a performance-driven life. They live a works-driven life. They live a life that is not balanced. It's not joyful. It is all about their behavior and their works and their performance. So we begin with the most important part of the house, and that's the foundation. You know, without a solid foundation, it doesn't matter how beautiful your house is, all the beautiful furnishings. You can have great pictures on the wall. You can have the most beautiful furniture. You can have all the internet and TV. You can even have like a home studio in your home. But if if without a good foundation, when difficulties come, when the rains come, that house is eventually going to crumble. So the most important part of the house is the foundation. And so what we want to look at today, and this is a great quote by A.W. Tozer in a book I highly recommend called The Knowledge of the Holy. He says this, 
What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so the foundation is this, who God is. Properly understanding the nature, the character, the attributes of God. And that's why studying a book like The Knowledge of the Holy or Knowing God by J.I. Packer or The God You Can Know by Dan DeHaan is so important. I don't know of a study that's more important to begin and to have as the foundation than a study of who God is. Do you know God? Do you know His attributes? You see, if you don't have a proper understanding of who God is, your whole house is going to be out of balance. And when you study God, it's not like going to Ryan's or some salad bar buffet where you say, you know, I want a little fried chicken. And oh, I like the, I like the dessert and I like the sundae and the ice cream. But you know, that broccoli and that cauliflower and those cucumbers, I don't really care for that. When you study God, you don't treat it like a salad bar. When you study God, you must learn all of His attributes because He is all that He says He is. And you don't pick and choose which attributes you like and don't like. Some parts of God, when you study Him, are very uncomfortable. Guess what our theme is this year for our Good Friday service? The wrath of God absorbed. The wrath of God absorbed. Absorbed by Jesus in the cross. You see, when you study God, you learn that He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You learn that He's the perfect Father. You learn that He is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. You learn that He is holy. You learn that He is full of grace, full of truth, full of mercy, full of patience, full of kindness. You learn that He is full of love and it's unconditional. And you also realize that there is anger and wrath. Because He's so loving and He's so holy, He hates sin. Therefore, He expresses that hatred of sin in His wrath. But we'll learn on Good Friday that the wrath of God was completely absorbed by Jesus on the cross. And if we let Jesus absorb God's wrath, we don't have to face it. But if we don't let Jesus absorb our wrath, we will face it. Because He cannot be holy and not also be just and bring judgment upon sin. So it's having an accurate understanding of who God is. In Jeremiah 9, it says, Let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. And let not a strong man boast of his strength, but let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me. And that word in the Hebrew is yada. Same word used of a man and woman having sexual relations. It's an intimate, personal, knowing God. Do you know Him? Are you growing in your understanding of God's character? One book I highly recommend is J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. And he says this, Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded as it were with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way you can waste your life and lose your soul. Now, a minute ago, I rattled off a bunch of God's attributes. Holy, loving, patient, kindness, goodness, gracious, mercy, anger, wrath, holy, loving. Those are the two, holy and loving, that I would say, if you were to summarize those, the attributes, and I would put these two under the umbrella of sovereignty, that He is sovereign, He's in control, all things subject themselves to His will, that under the umbrella of sovereignty... If I were to diagram the nature of God, I would put holy and loving as the most important attributes because I believe all the other attributes can in one way or another go under holy and loving. And where do we see His holiness and His love best expressed? At the cross of Jesus. Because at the cross, God's holiness was expressed in bringing judgment on sin and His love was manifested in putting His judgment on His own Son for you and me. And so the door into the house, the next part of the house diagram, is the cross. It's the person and the work of Jesus. That's the door. That's the only way into the house. It's through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. 
Acts 4 and 12 says, There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. 2 Timothy 1 or 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So it's through Jesus that we come to know God. It's through Jesus that we can have our sins forgiven. It's through Jesus that the wrath of God was absorbed. It's through Jesus that we can come into that personal relationship and enter the house. Have you received Jesus? Have you opened the door and received Christ in your life? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the way. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. Jesus says that I'm the, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So the door is the way into the house, and it's the only way in. Now once you enter that door, then the next part of the house is learning who we are in Christ. Learning your identity. Learning what God says about you. And we're going to have a whole message on our identity in Christ in this series, Ignite the Fire. We're going to have a whole message on the fourth piece of the house, which we'll get to in a minute. Because some of these pieces of the house are so important, we're going to devote a whole message to it. So right now, I'm just whetting your appetite. And to do that, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to see in 1 Peter chapter 2, really we have in 1 Peter 2, a biblical defense for the entire house diagram. Because you're going to see mention of who God is. You're going to see mention of who we are in Christ. And you're going to see mention of what we are to do, the roof of the house. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 6, it says, For it stands in Scripture, 1 Peter 2, 6, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, that's foundation, folks, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him, there's the door into the house, believing in Jesus will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, there's consequences. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. If you don't come through this door, if you don't receive Jesus, then Jesus becomes a stumbling block to you. That's not what you want. You want Him to be the cornerstone, not a stumbling block. They stumbled because they disobeyed the Word as they were destined to do. Verse 9. Now, we've got the foundation. We've got the door into the house. Now, what does it say? It talks about who we are. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That, here's behavior, you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Back to who we are. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Then look at this. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Now it's behavior. To abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Here's a behavior statement. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So what he's saying here is the next part of the house, after you've got the foundation, you're building that foundation. You're strengthening that foundation. You're coming to understand God more and more for who He is, His attributes, His character. Then you know that you're saved. Examine yourself to be sure you're of the faith. Know that you've come through the door of Jesus. Know that you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Then the most important thing to do is begin to understand who you are. You have a whole new identity now. When you're in Christ, you have a whole new identity because you have a whole new Father. And when the Bible says that the old things have gone and behold, all things have become new, that's talking about your identity. And we're going to unpack this in a few weeks. But for now, I would just say this. It is so crucial that you get your beliefs about yourself from God's Word and what God says about you. Not what the world says about you. Not maybe what your authority figure in your past said about you that you had friction with. Somebody that said, you're a loser. You're no good. You're ugly. You're dumb. You'll never amount to anything. If you've heard those voices, I'll tell you right now, it's not the voice of your Heavenly Father. He says you are loved. You are accepted. You are valued. You are holy. You are righteous in Christ. You've received a new nature. You are accepted by me. You're a sojourner and a stranger. You're a child of the living God. That's who you are. Don't let your past define you. 
Don't let your parents define you. Let God's Word define you. And let God's Word determine your destiny. Who you are in Christ. A book that had a huge impact on me because for a period of time I, I, I had turned my house upside down. I had allowed my behavior to become my foundation. It's interesting in my journey, I got saved my senior year in high school and started off where my focus was a lot of, of the progress of, that you see in this house. And I was spending time with the Lord and the joy of God was filling my life. And, and then I got involved in a ministry that was highly about what we do for God. And it had good intentions, so it's no fault of the ministry. But what it did in my life is, is I began to live a performance-oriented life. And I began to get my identity from what I did for God instead of who I was in Christ. And it, it, got, it got to a point where if I literally sat down and read the daily newspaper, I felt guilty because I felt like I was wasting time. Now there's a proper sense in which we need to be convicted of wasting time. But basically, I turned my house, I allowed my house to get turned upside down. And I began to make the foundation what I did for God. And so, somebody introduced me to a book that is, to this day, probably in my top five or ten all-time Christian books that I recommend every believer read, called Victory Over the Darkness by Neil Anderson. And I want to read a quote out of this book. He says, No one can consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with what he believes about himself. No one can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with what he believes about himself. And you see that in this passage in 1 Peter. He gives them truths about who they are before he challenges them about how they're to live. And I believe one of the things that has resulted in Christians today not having a joyful, loving, vibrant walk with God is they've turned the house upside down. And their performance or their works or their obedience doesn't flow out of intimacy with God but they're somehow still trying to earn God's love and favor. And it is crucial, beloved, that we grasp who we are in Christ. What are you believing about yourself? There is nothing more true of you than what God says about you. Now, concerning who we are in Christ, there is one truth about our identity that is really important. And it's upstairs in the house. And some of you haven't experienced this because you've heard noise upstairs. And it makes you uncomfortable. Or you've heard stories from others about what happens upstairs. And it makes you a little nervous. Or you've had bad theology about what's upstairs. And so you've shied away. It's the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I submit to you that this is a very, very, very important part of the house. It's the upstairs. The person and the power of the Spirit. What it means to be filled or controlled with the Holy Spirit. And once again, this is so important, we're going to devote a whole message to it. I think it might even be next week. I'm not sure, Jeff, I haven't looked at the preaching schedule lately. I think it might be next week. If it is, you don't want to miss it what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And let me remind you, church, the Holy Spirit is still the third member of the Trinity. The Trinity is not Father, Son, Holy Bible. The Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you and I cannot live the Christian life without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And He's a good Spirit. You don't need to be afraid of Him. You don't need to allow some of the people that have maybe misused Him or had theology about Him or said things to you about what it means to be filled that aren't necessarily true. You don't need to let those things scare you. You can open yourself up to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is good. And He's a gentle dove. And He wants to empower your life to live for Jesus. And so we'll unpack that. But just for now, I will say, Jesus for a reason said to the disciples, wait, wait until you're empowered with the Spirit before you begin to try to even live for me. In Ephesians 5.18, all Christians are commanded, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Moment by moment, day by day. 
In Acts 1 and 8 it says you will receive power when the Spirit's come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Philippians 4 and 13 says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that strength comes from the Holy Spirit. I want to have you turn to one verse real quick. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. Once again, another passage that supports this house diagram. Actually beginning in verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Look at how this supports the house diagram. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is bondage and heaviness and... No, no. Freedom. I love the freedom that I see in this church in worship. And it's not to be a show. It's not saying that you're more spiritual if you lift your hands. But I'll tell you, God wants to set us free. And He says to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I happen to believe that your body should be involved in worship. That doesn't mean, again, that you can, if your heart's right, you can worship better sitting on your hands. But I just think when the Spirit of the Lord gets a hold of you, often you'll want to do this. And you'll want to say, God, I just want to love you. I reach out to my daddy. I just, it's a sign of surrender. You know, if somebody sticks a gun to your back, what do you do? You lift up your hands. <laughs> it's a sign of surrender. It's a sign of love. It's a sign of reaching out to the Father. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And then look at this. And we all with unveiled face. That means you're seeing clearly. There's no veil in front of you. Beholding the glory of the Lord. That's the foundation of the house. Beholding the glory of the Lord. Glory means to fully reveal His character and His likeness. Glory represents all of His attributes. So you're beholding the glory of the Lord. And then what happens? You're being, that's a passive verb. It doesn't mean you don't do anything, but it means the active agent does the most of the work, and that is who? The Holy Spirit. You are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, and that comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It doesn't come by trying harder. It doesn't come by getting a bunch of rules that you try to live up to. It doesn't come by behavior modification. It comes by the Spirit. That's how you're transformed. Some of you aren't being transformed very well because you're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. You're trying to do it on your own. You're gutting it out. You're living by rules. You're a legalistic Pharisee. And it doesn't work and you're tired of it and you should be. Because that's not the way God intended it to work. It's the Holy Spirit living in you and through you. It's the exchange life. It's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's the exchange life. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that's an important part of the house. Now, we get to the roof. You say, what? It took us this long to get to the top of the house. That's right. <laughs> Because when the other stuff's happening the way God intended it to, usually the roof pretty much takes care of itself. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey. You just will. And so the roof is what we do. It's our obedience. It's our behavior. It's what others see. Sometimes it's our disobedience. But even when we disobey, when we're walking with God, we get convicted and we repent. And we say, I don't want to do that again. If you sin and you like it and aren't convicted, you're probably not saved. Because when a person who is saved and walking with God sins, and I'm not saying there's not the temporary pleasures of sin. I, I, Hebrews 11 talks about that. But for the most part, you get convicted. You feel bad. That's a good thing. Because God, by having you feel bad and convict you, is drawing you back to Himself. It's Hebrews 12. He disciplines those whom He loves. If you're without discipline, you're an illegitimate child and not a true child of God, the Bible says. So conviction is a good thing because it shows you that a God is inside of you called the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit gets offended, He speaks to you and He convicts you and He gives you bad feelings so that you'll repent. To drive you back to the cross. So the roof is what we do. And we saw in 1 Peter 2, behavior came out of identity. Behavior flowed out of identity. 
You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. And then he challenges them, live godly lives. In other words, love others because you're loved. Live holy because you are righteous in Christ. <laughs> Forgive others because you've been forgiven. Show grace to others because you've been shown grace. Be patient with others because God's been patient with you. You see, identity should always flow, or behavior should always flow out of identity. We obey because of who we are and who God is in the gospel. We don't behave to earn favor with God or get points with God or earn our salvation or to get Him to love us more. He already loves you as much as He ever could or will. So let me just show you an example of one part of the house as it relates to holiness. So we're called to live holy, right? The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. So, if we do it in the balanced way that this house diagram is intended to show us, you're called to holiness. But what's the approach that many people have to holiness? Well, you should do this and you can't do this and good Christians do this and good Christians don't do that and it's do, 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 do and don't, 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 don't. And we become like the elder brother in the, in the prodigal. The elder brother was just as much a prodigal as the younger brother because the elder brother thought that his acceptance with his father came from what he did. He didn't understand grace. And so we're called to holiness, but it all comes from the foundation. God, my God is holy. And the, and the gospel represents the holiness of God because he took the wrath of God for me. And, and I am holy in Christ. I'm already righteous in Christ. He's made me holy. He says in 1 Peter 2, you're a holy nation. And then the top of the house of that upstairs, we, we left that out, but that's filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and that gives us the power to live holy. You see how this works? This is the balanced Christian life. This is the stable Christian life. Don't turn your house upside down and make the foundation what you do. Keep the house right side up and live that joyful fruitful, obedient life that comes from a proper understanding of who God is, a proper understanding of the gospel, an accurate understanding of who you are in Christ, doing it in the power of the Spirit, and let your obedience and your works flow naturally from the bottom of the house. Don't make the roof the foundation. Final quote. I had to read this book when it came out, I think in the 80s, because I recognized the title described my life. Tired of Trying to Measure Up. <laughs> and I happened to be on staff with the guy who wrote it in Minneapolis, so that helped. But the, the title, it was like, whoa. And I had to read that book, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty, because that was my experience at the time. <laughs> Listen to what he says, Jeff Van Vonderen. Many Christians live their whole lives trying to earn with their own behavior, roof of the house, what was already purchased for them by the blood of Jesus, door of the house, and who we are in Christ. Life, value, and God's approval. Jesus came to make you acceptable to God, and He has. <laughs> Earning value and acceptance isn't possible. Thankfully, it's already been given to us by God's grace through Christ's performance. Amen. Isn't that good? And if that really resonates with you today, I encourage you to, to get that book. Get Victory Over the Darkness. One other thing, and then I think we'll have time for a few questions. I have found this house diagram to be extremely practical when I spend time with God, which I spoke about last week. The importance of seeking God. The importance of having a time every day that you're in the Word and prayer. So one of the ways that I often will approach Scripture when I'm meditating on Scripture, I don't do this every day, but particularly a passage that seems to lend itself to this, I'll do this. I'll say, what does this passage teach me about who God is? What does this passage teach me about the Gospel? What does this passage teach me about who I am in Christ? Now, not every Scripture has something for all of those, but you might be surprised how many do. What does this passage teach me about the indwelling Christ? And then I'll ask, what does this passage teach me about what I should do? All right. Where are you at today? Do you know God? How's your foundation? 
Have you come through the door of Jesus? Are you born again? Are you saved? Do you know you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Do you know your identity? Are you growing in your understanding of who you are in Christ? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Is your obedience flowing out of a love relationship with God? You see, I think we could probably all identify one part of the house, at least one part of the house, that might need some attention. Where is your house the most stable? And where does your house need a little remodeling? <laughs> that you might experience the balanced, stable Christian life. Let me pray for us and then we'll open it up to a few questions. Identify right now what part of your house God would want you to give some more attention to. Lord, I pray that you'd encourage every person here today, if there be any that are not in relationship with you through Jesus, I ask you to give them the grace to repent and receive Christ today. And I pray for every believer here that you would show them specifically what areas of their house might need some attention. And I pray this week would be one of the most encouraging, joyful, fruitful weeks they've ever experienced because they begin to get their house in balance. In Jesus' name, amen. Shannon and Jimmy... Jimmy, you grab that one. Shannon, here you go. We've got about five minutes or so. We can take a few questions about what we looked at. So raise your hand and they'll bring the mic to you. This is always a fun part of our service. I'm always impressed with the kind of questions you guys ask. Come on. Way too slow today. Usually the hands just you bolt up. Everything. You covered everything too well. I know that's not the case. <laughs> Come on. Or a comment. If something in this, Jarrett, over here, if, if something has been something you've experienced, you can uh, mention that as well, like in a testimony. I just wanted to say that having the Holy Spirit abiding within you is one of the most joyous things that you can ever experience. It's not a hard thing. It's just submitting yourself and letting God have his way. Mm. And then you let him have his way and you meditate upon his word. Then as you walk, sometimes you might feel like you're walking alone, but he's there. He's mm. nudging you. And I just thank God for that because it's mm. a wonderful feeling. Uh, don't be afraid to open up and let the Lord have his way because the best passage that you will ever get to freedom. Mm, good word. Thank you, Leola. Good stuff. So there's your testimony for next week's sermon on the Holy Spirit. This may be a, a very vague question, but I'm just wondering how do we, like, how could we go day to day, like, actually making sure we're focusing on the foundation and in Christ when that's influence and feeling being filled in what we do does that really come do you think that comes through like spending quality time with God or constantly yep. reminding ourselves of scripture when we're going to do something or just is that a daily thing that we need to do and how do we like keep that foundation forefront in our heart and mind to where we actually do live out of that mm. yes 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 <laughs> it is all of those um, I uh, I believe God gives our emotions sometimes as a signal as to whether or not we're living it like we should. Now, this, there's exceptions to this. So don't, make, don't, don't take this as our feelings are always the barometer. But often, I think, our feelings are. You know, think about the fruit of the Spirit. Some of those are very emotional-oriented. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I mean, a lot of those have emotion in them. So if you're finding yourself throughout the day not experiencing love, joy, and peace, let's just take those three, then it might be a signal. It's like the blinking light on the dashboard of your car. Lift up the hood. Something needs attention. And lift up the hood and just, and just meditate on the, on the house diagram. Take a moment and just think about who God is and let that lead to worship. God, I just worship you that you're holy. I worship you that you're so full of grace, that you're patient, that your mercies are new every morning, that you are kind, that you're an Abba Daddy. Just start recounting. That's why studying something like this is crucial, to know His attributes so well that you can just spew them out like I just did. 
And so that as you worship Him for those attributes and recount them to yourself, that goes from your mind to your spirit. Sometimes you have to talk yourself into believing. I don't, that sounded weird. But you know what I mean? I mean, speak the truth to yourself. That's what I meant to say. Speak the truth to yourself, and it'll find its way to your emotions. It will. It just works that way. And so, or then you, then you move from there to the door. And you're walking to class, you're driving to work, and you just say, God, thank you for the gospel. Let it be fresh and real in me today. So use this to, for, to, for worship and prayer. Then begin to recount who you are in Christ. Get one of those uh, little uh, bookmarks that we have on the table for, new, for visitors. It's all these truths out of victory of the darkness about who you are in Christ. Just start reciting those. Speak the truth to yourself. It'll drive the enemy away. It'll invite the presence of God. And it'll, it'll help you believe the truth. Sometimes we have to speak truth to ourselves. Martin Luther said, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Then begin to go to the top of the upstairs. God, fill me afresh with your spirit today. I'm down. I'm discouraged. I'm struggling. Just fill me. Take over, Lord. So that's how I would say you could use that in a very practical way. Yes. David, what do you think um, in the church today, and maybe even particularly at different generational levels are some gaps that we have in our understanding of God and oh, His attributes. Huge gaps because, um, yeah, you talk to a Ralph and Levon Motzinger and I'll bet you they would tell you that years ago all the churches preached pretty accurately about the character of God. Now, oh my goodness, look how far we've drifted. You know, it's greasy grace. It's God accepts everything. And the holiness has just been thrown right out. And so I think it is. I think we're living in a culture where not only the world is feeding lies to us about God. Well, all roads lead to God. Everybody's the same. Hindu God, Muslim God, Buddhist God, Christian God, they're all the same. No, they're not. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we got that in our world. We got the devil, of course, and he's playing on all this. Then we've even got many churches that aren't even preaching the whole counsel of God. And they're shying away from uncomfortable things. I mean, our topic on Good Friday, the wrath of God, that probably seems so radical to a lot of people today. You want do, do a search, wrath of God. Go to Blue Letter Bible, which is the app I encourage you all to have on your phone. It's free, Blue Letter, and just do a search, wrath. Oh my goodness, you're going to run headlong and after headlong after headlong into so many verses, Old Testament and New Testament. You know, something, well, God of wrath, that's the Old Testament. God of love in the New Testament. <laughs> He's not changed. <laughs> The difference is the cross absorbed His wrath for you and me. But if you don't come through the cross, then you will get His wrath. That's what the Bible says. There is a real hell. The Bible speaks of it. But yet, so many shy away from it. So I think all of that plays into this, this whole foundation piece is so important and it's so crucial that you get it right. That you go to the Word for your beliefs about God, not from culture and unfortunately not from some churches. And that's why you get those sermon notes every week. Don't believe it because David says it. You go to the Word. You're not going to stand before the Lord one day and have to give an account for David's preaching except that which came from God's Word. So you're accountable to the Word of God. Go back to the Scripture so that your beliefs and your convictions are based upon His infallible, inerrant Word. And aren't you glad we have His Word? Aren't you? Aren't you glad we have His Word? Amen. His Word is settled in heaven, the Bible says. The sum of thy Word is truth. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. One more. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest lies the enemy hits us with as believers is what it means to be in Christ, who we really are. Yep especially as it relates to, you know, past sins and, yes. and receiving forgiveness yes. for past sins. And yes. send us in that. Talk about that for a second. Oh, man, and that's why we're going to devote a whole message to identity because it's so crucial. So many get their beliefs about themselves from all kinds of sources that aren't the final source. And, and I think you touched on a huge one. Beloved, if you have sinned, and we all have, we all have things that we feel horrible about today. Whether you did it last night, last week, last year, or last decade. If you repent, 
That means to turn from it. You're not just asking forgiveness so you can kind of, oh, got that dealt with, now I can go do it again. That's not repentance. If you repent of your sin, you're truly, it's, it's the sorrow that leads to repentance, Corinthians says. Corinthians talks about two kinds of sorrows. There's a sorrow, that's you felt bad because you got caught. <laughs> but true godly sorrow is you felt bad because you did it and you offended a holy God and you truly want to change and you cry out and you go to the cross and you confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If you repent and confess, it is forgiven. It is thrown in the lake where there's a no fishing sign. <laughs> he says He cast your sins into the sea. And it also says He remembers them no more. You say, how can God remember, not remember our sins? But He's all-knowing. He chooses to not bring it back up against you because it was paid for at the cross. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 can say, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. If you've brought it to the cross, it is forgiven, it is cleansed, you are righteous in Jesus. So when Satan brings back your past sin, you just remind him of, your, of his future and you remind yourself that it's under the blood. And so every time those condemning thoughts come, those accusations, that's one of the chief job descriptions of Satan, Revelation 12. He's the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you day and night. But that's why you have to be armed with the truth of God's Word to counter those accusations and say, I know I did that. Yes, I did. But I brought it to the cross. It's forgiven. I'm righteous in Jesus. And I'm going to move on in the righteousness of Jesus. And I'm not going to let Satan condemn me or accuse me. That's how you have to face this, folks. That's how you fight this with the truth of God's Word. And the Bible says the truth will set you free. Alright, worship team, come on up. And let's respond to what we've heard. Our prayer team, if you'd be available along the sides, if anybody needs prayer, give you two opportunities on Communion Sunday. You get opportunities during the Lord's Supper and then now. So uh, we're going to sing one song, Cornerstone. Great song. Jesus is our cornerstone. Amen? So let's worship Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Get prayer if you need it. Somebody along the sides, or maybe you're sitting next to somebody, or somebody across the room that you trust to pray for. You don't have to just go to the prayer team. Go to anybody that you, that you trust. Let's be a praying people. Don't leave with a burden that someone could help pray for you about and have it taken off your shoulders. Cast all your cares on Him. He cares for you. Let's be a church that loves one another, supports one another. Let's be a church that's open and transparent properly about our struggles. Let's be a church where we can say, you know, I'm heavy today, or I feel like God's saying something to me through this message, but I can't really identify what it is. Would you just pray that I'd have clarity? Whatever the need, get prayer. Let's stand together.